Can you hear me okay? Fantastic. Thank you. Um, if you wouldn't mind taking your seat. Brett, do we have you at the front here? Front of the class. Uh, good morning. Um, my name's Natalie Pereira. I'm Executive Director of the Education Policy Institute. And we're delighted to be here today to launch the OECD's PISA 2016 findings. Um, for those of you that don't know much about my organisation, the EPI, um, we are an independent, impartial research organisation that focuses on education and young people's mental health. So studies like today that look at international comparative data and seek to start a debate about what works and what doesn't work sits at the heart of our um, policy and efforts at the EPI. As I say, we're very pleased today to be able to host the OECD, and I'm told that it is in fact um, the first time that the PISA results have been launched in London, so uh, that we're really pleased to be able to have you all here today for, uh, for, for that uh, uh, occasion. Um, we will start off with a welcome by the OECD General Secretary, Angel Guria, um, and then he will be followed by Andreas Schleicher, who will give, uh, give us a detailed um, presentation about the PISA findings, uh, with some reference to the UK findings too. Um, there'll then be an opportunity to ask questions to both the Secretary General and to Andreas for about 20 minutes, depending on timing. Um, there'll then be a short coffee break. If members of the media and press want to stay behind for that coffee break um, to continue asking questions to the OECD, then they're very welcome to do so. After the coffee break, we'll convene a panel of experts um, and we'll use that panel discussion to talk about the value of international benchmarking and comparisons, what it means for the UK, and particularly explore the, um, the main theme of PISA 2015, which is the importance of science. Um, a quick reminder that the embargo lifts at uh, 10 o'clock, which I think is in about 10 minutes. Um, so feel free to start tweeting at that point. The hashtag is OECD uh, PISA. Um, so first off, I'm delighted to welcome onto the stage the OECD Secretary General. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, right, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Natalie, and uh, thank you uh, for hosting us today. I'd like to uh, say not only uh, how much we appreciate this invitation, but Natalie, also David Laws, thank you so much, uh, and uh, to all the team here at the Institute. Um, let me. Um, say that uh, we live in challenging lives, and uh, this is, I suppose, always true, but uh, if you read the headlines of yesterday and the day before, the day before, in the last uh, few weeks, etc., you really confirm that, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're still reeling from a global crash that pushed the world into a low growth, low productivity trap. We're seeing rising inequalities. Uh, we're seeing some growing opportunities for some. Um, we're seeing precarious, poor quality jobs for others. We're experiencing tidal movements of people fleeing poverty or fleeing war, but also competing for jobs in their places of destination or in the places in between. Um, we're benefiting from the opportunities provided by the digital revolution. But automation is at the same time uh, threatening certain jobs and certain sectors. So something that you would normally see as a great opportunity and a great leveler, you know, is, is now not the case. It depends on, again, your point of view uh, and whether you are 
one of those that has benefited from modernity or not. These factors are fueling global turbulence, uh, rising populism. Most feel that uh, they're being left behind, while a happy few benefit from the fruits of globalization. Now, high quality education is the single greatest tool for empowering people and improving their opportunities and their outcomes. That is why this morning, we, with uh, my colleagues Andreas and uh, Liza and uh, all the team of uh, uh, PISA, by the way, a part of the team is in Mexico and part of the team is in uh, Berlin and part of the team is in Tokyo and part of the team uh, will soon be in uh, Washington and all over the place because we're doing rollouts like this one in different uh, parts of the world. But this is the, the universal rollout. This is the rollout for the world and then we'll do, we'll do local uh, rollouts. So I'm delighted to launch the latest results of the OECD's flagship program of international student assessment, so-called PISA. Now, this triennial international survey tests the skills and the knowledge of 15-year-old students, and it provides a global benchmark for the quality, the equity, and the efficiency of school systems. PISA is an integral part of the OECD's inclusive growth initiative. Now, in 2015, half a million students, actually 540,000 or something like that, uh, representing 29 million 15-year-olds in 72 countries and economies, this is not about the OECD countries, 72 countries, took the internationally agreed two-hour test covering science, mathematics, reading, and now collaborative problem solving and financial literacy. And I say now because these are dimensions which were not included in the original in 2000, 2003, but now have become or you know, have been first perceived, identified, and then confirmed as being crucial for the measuring and the developing of um, the young men and women. Uh, and therefore, uh, this collaborative problem solving and financial literacy is added to the science, mathematics, and the reading. Today, the OECD is releasing volumes one and two of PISA. This is volume one. It says, Excellence and Equity in Education. In volume two, policies and practices for successful schools. So this one is the broader policy issues, and this is a more specific uh, part of the problem, which is how to deal with the school as a unit of analysis and all the interactions that happen in the schools. You, of course, have and were provided with a um, the short version. Now, this one is out, outside there in the, uh, on the table, the first, the first one. The second one is, uh, uh, all, are, all are available online already, but uh, the second one will soon be available in, in uh, you know, large, large amounts. Actually, you just finished uh, printing it. Don't rub it too much, otherwise the ink will fall off. <laughs> so, so uh, now, this, this, uh, uh, these uh, excellence and ed equity in education and uh, policies and practices for successful schools focus on student performance in science. Why in science? Well, because, you know, we, we kind of rotate. Every three years, once it's reading, then it moves to mathematics, then it moves to science, and then we come back. Uh, and now time, this is the time for science. This is the sixth delivery, right? <coughs> Sixth delivery, and uh, well, I suppose second time we visit science. Um, and it's interesting because the numbers will allow you to see, okay, when was the last time that we visited science? Well, 2006 as the main theme. Today it's 10 years later. 
So you basically have a 10-year hiatus, which you know we're kind of culturally used to thinking in decades. Um, and uh, it, it provides a very interesting comparator. And it actually is in the tables, in the, many, in the very, very minute detail that it has, there's these comparisons in terms of the 2012 or the 2015. And they allow you to see who are the ones who advance more and who are flatlining or lagging behind. The final volumes to be released next year will focus on student well-being and the social skills that we talked about, as well as the financial literacy. So let's talk about some of the findings. First, science. That's the focus. The focus on science is timely. With rapid scientific and technological progress, the advent of the Internet of Things, and the prevalence of social media, the ability to understand and discriminate information based on evidence and facts is critical. These days, everyone must, and I quote here, think like a scientist, unquote. And that means that you get the information, but you have to also navigate the claims and the counterclaims bombarding us in everyday life, not because we don't have enough information, but because we have too much information and sometimes contradictory information. So thinking like a scientist means you can discriminate and you can separate one from the other. And that affects, you know, nutrition, climate change, um, you know, a, a, a number of things and everything has a scientific element to it, a science uh, base to it. Now, in most countries, this is the good news, growing number of students expect to pursue a science-related career. That has somewhat improved. But the conclusion is science education isn't keeping up. Why? Because science itself is moving at lightning speed. I mean, when you talk about the more obvious uh, progress on uh, things like uh, digital and uh, all these things, and, and physics and chemicals and chemistries and, and medicine, all these things are almost now cliches. And that's all part, that's because science is moving so fast. But the education of science has not moved at the same speed. The contents have not enriched themselves enough to catch up. And they are not diverse or do not cover enough of the ground, which does not mean that every 15-year-old has to be, you know, Einstein. It means that there are certain things that are happening in the environment of which they have to be aware, and which if, if they're not aware, and this is not brought to them by the education system, they will be at a disadvantage when they go out there and have to deal with real life. PISA does not measure whether you remember the multiplication tables. You know. PISA measures what you do with it. It's about what you do with what you know. And therefore, if we are detecting that there is a deficit in terms of, or a lag between the speed at which science moves at, and the speed at which science education moves, it means, first of all, they're obviously not moving at the same speed, but second, that there is a deficit being created every day, which is cumulative, because there's so much being added every day. This is the main message, the main concern. Now, it's not that we're saying, you know, there's an alarm, the barn is burning, you know, it's, it's, it's a, there are a number of, as you will see, there are a number of countries that are doing better, uh, but, but mostly what you have is a condition of flatlining. And uh, here, uh, let me just, here, so, Average three-year trend in science performance since 
2006. This is, as I told you, these are the 2006-2016 the results, or 2005-2015 results, when it comes to, um, so, to science. And then you see a number of countries that are doing somewhat better, uh, a number of countries in the uh, far right that are doing uh, uh, somewhat worse. But fundamentally, what you have is even the average of the OECD is flat. So you would have, you would have imagined with a massive improvement in the last 10 years with science that you would have a real, real accumulation of everybody you know, on the uh, very positive side with increases in the performance because why? They would have performed better because they would have been educated more and better about the sciences, and therefore you would have had better grades in the sciences. You know, you would have expected better grades in general, but basically you, you would have expected that on sciences you would. So this is an issue. Now, since 2006, standards in science have flatlined, with less than a quarter of the countries improving their performance. And uh, now, that's despite a spending increase in the OECD countries of 20% per primary and secondary student. So it's not that there hasn't been an increase on the budget side. Actually interesting, even, you know, it's been tough. These have been very tough 10 years because the crisis hit two years after the last comparison in 2006 on science. So immediately we had a very tough period, it, even then, You've increased 20% this expenditure in education in general, but again, we do not have very good uh, results in terms of science. Now, here um, we have the cases where you say spending per student from the age of 6 to 15. That's over that period, 6 to 15, science performance, and then you have the how much you spend and where you perform. Here you have a cluster which are mostly uh, developing countries where the, um, well, you have a, a much more direct, with the, exempl uh, with the exception of the Dominican Republic, uh, which is uh, uh, not, not really very typical behavior, but everybody says, okay, the more you spend, the better you do, okay? This is the developing countries. But what's happening to the rest of the countries? Basically, even if they spend a lot more, their results do not get much better. I mean, and some of them are spending really a lot more, huh? and the results do not get a lot better. So there's a question of allocation, there's a question of what we do with it, and, and how we, we deal with that. Now, so uh, Singapore is a standout performer in science, and it really stands kind of on itself in terms of the grades. Uh, uh, 546 uh, there, Singapore. Then of the OECD, we have Japan, Estonia, Finland, and Canada. Um, but across the OECD, more than one in five students fall short of baseline proficiency in science. And in some cases, it is close to one of every two. What do we mean here? This means that uh, you, you have, you know, like, Average, uh, most of the ones you, you will have one in five. Okay, one in five means 20%, still very high. Proficiency level two means you can't perform pretty fundamental uh, operations and calculations. You're basically illiterate when it comes to dealing with relatively small challenges. Uh, or the, 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 say the functional equivalence of, of illiteracy, because of course you can speak and you can talk, but you, you can't deal with the issues. Whereas, but you see some countries, now again, don't take Dominican Republic because it's a little uh, complicated, it's, it's an outlier, but take the others there, you see up to countries like Colombia, or countries like Mexico, or countries like, you're talking about, you know, 50, this is the 50 last, you know, you're talking about a bunch of countries pretty close to 50 lines. That means one in two that can't deal with the fundamentals. So it tells you that there is a very, very uh, long way to go. Now, uh, 
This means it can't use basic or everyday scientific knowledge to identify a valid conclusion from a simple data set, an ability we expect from every citizen. Only one in 12 is a top performer, but of the very, very top performers, about one in six comes from four provinces in China alone. So very high concentration again. Yet in Singapore, one in five students master the most advanced scientific problems and demonstrate that they think like scientists. Why? Let me tell you something. Every time we put out these numbers, the first thing some people do when they are practitioners or feel affected or somehow attacked or you know that these numbers are saying something wrong about what they're doing, you know, uh, they, they say, ah, yes, but, and they cast question marks on the results of China or of Singapore or, uh, well, let me tell you what is happening. And this is crucial because this is connected to the results of the test. Look at the numbers. It says, okay, the mean performance in science, this is the overall, 556, you know, is evaluate and design scientific inquiry. This is the very uh, white one. Explain phenomena scientifically. Interpret data and evidence scientifically. This is the average of the OECD, the more, uh, let's say prosperous countries in the world as a group, 35, representing 50% of the world GDP. And this is Singapore. So why is Singapore better? You say, oh, it's a freak, or because they stole the test, whatever, you know, there's all sorts of excuses. All sorts of excuses given. No, absolutely not. If you look at the fundamentals of why people excel in science, and it is related to every single result in this report, it is because there is a, you know, explain the phenomena scientifically. Who does this? The teachers explain the phenomena scientifically, and the students then respond to the questionnaire by saying, yes, my teacher explains the phenomena, and I understand it better because he tells me what happens before and after, and what has in between, and how do you make it happen? The students are telling us that this is why they do better and they like it and they choose a career, you know, every, all the good things. Huh? Second, they're saying interpret data and evidence scientifically. This means they are able to explain what they are talking about and describe it rather than simply, you know, it's not a multiple, multiple question and just, you know, you hit it by chance. You, you basically have what is called thinking like a scientist. And that means they replicate what they saw in the school, in the class, and they are able to explain and roll out what they saw. So uh, again, uh, well, there you have the gap. You know, 550, 553 is the average, whatever it is, vis-a-vis, uh, you know, -vis, 493 to 553. It's 60 points. What is 60 points? Uh, Andres, correct me if I'm wrong. Every 40 points is like a year. 60 points means a year and a half. Imagine that 15-year-olds in Singapore, vis-a-vis -vis an average OECD young man or woman, as if the Singaporeans had gone to school or taken classes the equivalent of one and a half years more. Well, that's a huge gap. And it also carries when you're talking about performance in university, when you're talking about performance at work, etc. So I just want to say this because, again, this is a, a, a very nice validation of the numbers. It also explains, well, um, that we don't have to go to a crystal ball to see who and what does better. We cannot be all Singaporeans. Uh, but we can learn from the Singaporeans and from the Finns and from the Canadians. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, 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 a lot to, there's a lot that we can learn from the best practices. So, um, there's, uh, uh, let, let me now 
go to the second key topic, equity. Now, student achievement should reflect their abilities and should reflect their efforts, not their personal backgrounds, not their personal circumstances. The best systems are the ones who break with the past, break with the family, break with the, with the socioeconomic uh, you know, background of the parents of the family. From 2006 to 2015, no country or economy improved its performance in science and equity in education simultaneously. That means some are a little bit more equitable. Access, quality, etc. Some have improved their um, numbers, but we don't have countries that have improved both equity and the um, in the uh, well the, the performance in science uh, at the same time. And frankly, uh, this is quite shocking. This is. Well, this is an alarm, and we should be taking it very seriously. Disadvantaged students in OECD countries are, on average, almost three times more likely to be low performers than disadvantaged students. Look. These are <coughs> odds ratio. That means the number of times <coughs> that, how many, you know, how many times is it more probable that well, again, Dominican Republic outlier. But the province of Argentina, this is Buenos Aires, you know, the province of Buenos Aires in Argentina, and the whole of the Peru. Singapore over here is one that says disadvantaged students are almost three times more likely to be low performance in science, <laughs> which means if you are disadvantaged, even in the country that does best, which again talks about equity, they are the ones who have the best grades, but they are not providing a system that will allow for the great equalizer to come in and, and even the level playing field. I'm not certainly lower it. I'm saying even it, OK? So that those who come from a more disadvantaged background can actually have a chance to do better. So there you are, you know, all the way to, well, it, you wouldn't expect you no, know, likelihood of, of, of students in the bottom quarter scoring below level two in science relative to non-disadvantaged. So this is a relative. This is why it's odds, you know, number of times. There you are. It's uh, pretty, pretty clear. The, now, the uh, disadvantaged students also tend to spend 35 minutes per week less in regular science lessons are twice as likely to have repeated a grade by the time they sit the PISA test, and almost three times more likely to be enrolled in a vocational rather than an academic track. Poverty today need not predetermine outcomes tomorrow. That should not be the case. Almost one third of disadvantaged students, and even more, let's say we're in the UK, in the UK, that is the case, are considered resilient. This is very interesting and very important. So I just said that there's a big, but there's a group. There's a group. One third of disadvantaged students beat the odds and perform at high levels. These are the cases of those who actually overcome the, let's say, the disadvantage that they had by design in the beginning. In Japan, Hong Kong, and Estonia, the 20%, please listen to this, the 20% most disadvantaged students do as well as the average student in the OECD area. The 20% most disadvantaged do the same as the average in the OECD. And that 20% of the disadvantaged do better, do better, actually, than the most advantaged students in the 20 other OECD countries. 
That means a better performance in some of the developing countries, etc. It's, it's interesting because there's this, the, the resilient type. This is where the, the leaders come out. This is where your political leaders, your science leaders, your, you know, your, your, your thought leaders, whatever. That, uh, well, because they, they overcome the odds. They have the character, they have the strength, they have the discipline, they have the will. Um, now, we know how they do it. They set high and universal expectations for all students. These countries that have this best performance and this strong, um, you know, resilient group. They set high and universal expectations for all students. They keep an unwavering focus on great teaching. Great teaching. Did I say great teaching? They target resources on struggling students and schools. And they stick with coherent, long-term strategies. They stay the course. They set a course and stay the course. The performance of immigrant students is also an issue that we have to take a look. Uh, while there are more than twice, they are more than twice as likely as their non-immigrant peers to perform below baseline proficiencies in science, almost one quarter of the disadvantaged immigrant students match the performance of the top quarter of the students internationally. Here you have non-immigrant students, immigrant students. Now, it's only countries where there's a relatively important population, so to make it meaningful, and then what you have is basically a, a pretty, you know, a more or less constant, and that is that the non-immigrants vis-a-vis um, -vis the immigrants uh, tend to do better, that the immigrant students struggle more, if you will. Uh, but there are a group of resilient students coming from the bottom 25%, that perform among the top 25% of all countries. Again, this is uh, because there's always this, this group of excellence who have themselves some qualities that make them overcome the odds. Now, in uh, Hong Kong, in Macau, in Singapore, more than half of all the disadvantaged immigrant students are resilient. I mean, it's amazing. Huh? In Hong Kong, Macau, and Singapore, more than half of all the disadvantaged immigrant students are resilient. That means they can get as good grades as the top. And uh, as are more than one in the three disadvantaged immigrant students in Australia, Canada, Estonia, Ireland, and here in the UK. I was telling uh, Andreas and uh, Lisa here that if you look at these pretty heavy on the Anglos, huh? with the exception of perhaps Estonia, uh, so there's something there I have to say. And of course, everything came out of here, right? It started with the UK here. So, so there must be something good there in the, in the oxygen. Um, uh, performance gaps are also narrowing. Between 2006 and 2015, the average difference in science performance between immigrant and non-immigrant students fell by six points. That's a good trend. It's a modest trend, but it's a good trend. Is it fast enough? No, we would have expected that to be a little better. Um, PISA 2015 data also revealed differences between schools. Disadvantaged schools have fewer qualified science teachers, and tend to offer a much narrower range of learning opportunities beyond regular classes. They also tend to suffer more disciplinary problems and a lack of student engagement, such as late arrivals and truancy. I don't think we have a, we have a, a graph for that, but uh, because there are a number of, uh, there are a number of reasons. Uh, but disadvantaged schools, fewer qualified science teachers, 
offer a much narrower range of learning opportunities beyond regular classes. Again, this is a pattern that repeats itself in every country. Interestingly, PISA 2015 shows that a privately funded education is not a guarantee of success. After accounting for the socioeconomic profile of students in schools, students in public schools actually score higher than students in private schools in science, on average, across OECD countries, and in 22 education systems other than the 35 OECD members. So here, public and private. There you are, students in public schools perform better, students in private schools perform better, and you see that basically the ones over here that perform better on the side of public schools are a somewhat larger number and that the improvement in the private school part, with the exception of a couple, which are the Emirates and Qatar, basically is relatively modest. So um, again, there's a, a question, of a, a bit of a, of a jinx, you know, that you, you say, well, just, just go, you go to private schools and you get a be better education, et cetera. It's not, not necessarily the case. In terms of equity, however, we cannot overlook the gender dimension. That's another challenge I'd like to mention. Um, the difference is not how good they are at science, but in their attitude to science. So, gender dimension. Um, in science, gender differences remain entrenched. Boy, boys are more likely to be poor performers. Yes, but they're also much more likely to be top performers in science. That means, in general, the girls are doing the same, even better. They've overcome the boys, yes, but when it comes to science, um, the boys do better than the girls. Finland is the only country in which girls are more likely to be top performers than boys in science. We actually get asked to see how we can level the playing field to help the poor boys and the poor men you know, you know, in Finland. But that's only in Finland. You know, don't, don't get carried away. It's just... so, but, but then you see, no? you see the differences, gender differences among top performance in the science. Um, the story here is not about abilities. It's about different interests, confidence levels, and career expectations. Although around a quarter of the boys and girls expect to work in science-related fields, this is a very broad definition, science-related fields. So, so boys are twice as likely to expect to work as engineers, scientists, and architects. Girls, three times as likely to expect to work as doctors, vets, and nurses. So there you are. Science and engineering professionals, you can see the boys much, much uh, more. <laughs> Health professionals, the girls, multiple. Information, ICT professionals, very small with the girls. This is about expectations. Huh? It doesn't carry necessarily into the actual practice, but you're talking about expectations. Science-related technicians or associate professionals, again, and this is because we're measuring 15-year-olds, which are not yet in the career, uh, in the professional stage. So um, this is uh, now data from previous PISA assessments show how these gender differences are reinforced by the attitudes and the inherent biases of parents, teachers, and even of textbooks. So. Stereotyping starts at home. We blame the schools. We blame the workplace. And basically, it starts at home. Now, the way forward. No single combination of policies that will work for all education systems. And implementation will always reflect the local context. By the way, you can have the best design recommendations, but it's going to be about implementation, implementation, implementation. Not necessarily in that order, as we say at the OECD. Why? Because you do take into account the local situation. But again, 
Uh, everybody uses the local context as an excuse. You say, oh yes, this is true, this is interesting, this is fantastic, but we're different. Special conditions apply. And everybody is unique, everybody is distinct, everybody is original, everybody is different, but not so unique and different and distinct and different that you do not have very important common threads, common elements in what makes for a good, uh, you know, a good education system. And well, and then in particular, um, the question of science here. So what do we recommend? Increase support to disadvantaged students and schools. Specific programs may help spark interest in science among students who may not receive such stimulation from their family. Disadvantaged students also need more time and regular lessons with better teaching. And in countries and economies where students in advantaged schools spend more time studying after school, Croatia, Italy, Japan, Korea, Macau, Chinese Taipei, governments may need to provide disadvantaged schools with additional resources for free of charge tutoring to prevent the development of a shadow education system and also to ensure equity in education opportunities. Why? I went a little fast there. What does it mean? These are systems in which it is almost a given that after school, you have to hire private tutors to then come and complement the education that your children will receive at school. First of all, we have measured the fact that in many of these cases, where the child is already eight, eight, eight hours in school, and then you, know, you come home all exhausted and putting him two hours through a special tutorship or whatever, if, 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 if the guy is still you know, awake, um, is not necessarily conducive to better grades. In fact, it can be counterproductive. It's also terrible for family life because you know, the parents work 14 hours a day anyway. But so these are cultures uh, you know, uh, the, in the Far East. And, uh, but also because the, co the competitive nature is it. If you don't go, if you don't hire the special teacher, then he will not get the better grades and he will not be able to access the better school. And, you know, and, and then he will not be able to go to the university. And so this is, the, the child is like seven year olds and already you are you know, sweating because he won't be able to get to the best university. You know, so, and, and then you, you put him through this, this ringer, uh, which is very, very uh, difficult. But the problem is it also makes families poor because not every family is prepared to lay out a pocket. And at the same time, every family feels the same type of competitive pressure. So again, we're saying, if you're gonna do that, let's have some kind of... Now, the sorting process, the so-called tracking, that's another recommendation. At Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, Harry Potter and his classmates were very, very early, in fact, as they arrived. They were sorted into the Gryffindor, Ravenclaw, Hufflepuff, or Slytherin. First day. Now, an early sorting may be appropriate for students of magic, but it doesn't work in the real world. All students, whether advantaged or disadvantaged, immigrant or non-immigrant, would benefit from a more limited application of policies that sort students into different program tracks or different schools, particularly if such policies are applied in the earliest years of secondary school. The longer you delay this decision, the better it is. The better prepared the children uh, will be, uh, and at the same time, the systems will be in order to identify, uh, there will be more signals about what it is that the child will do better. The later students are selected, the later students are, the, the later students are grouped, the less they repeat grades, the better they are supported by their teachers, and the weaker the association between students socioeconomic status or their family socioeconomic status, um, then the stronger will be the performance of science. Again, 
The later students are sorted or tracked, the better. The less they repeat grades. We've been saying it from year one, you know, from 2000. Repeating grades doesn't work. By the way, we have about 30% or more countries, 30 countries actually, that now have less great repetition in the overall numbers. You know? So it seems to be moving in the right direction. The better they're supported by their teachers and the weaker the association between socioeconomic background of the parents and the families um, with their performance, the better. Now, continue investing in good teachers and empower them to teach effectively. This is another one. The most successful education systems attract and retain the best teachers. Offer adequate compensation, encourage continued professional development, and provide ongoing feedback. Granting schools more autonomy may give teachers more opportunities to adapt their instruction to students' needs and to students' knowledge. A flexible system, you know, the rigid systems where there's an inspector who's going to check whether on session 17 you're looking at lesson 17 and what the issues have to be and what the children have to memorize uh, lesson 17 that day and if they're not at 17, if they're in 16 or in 18, then the teacher gets a bad mark when the inspector reports, you know, these kinds of rigidities which we probably have all seen uh, in our own um, uh, classrooms when we were uh, students um, is something which has to be made more flexible and when you do it more flexible, the system works better. And then breaking down stereotypes. Parents, teachers, policymakers, opinion leaders should actively challenge gender stereotypes about science-related activities and occupations. For example, these people say, oh, computer science is for boys. So biology is for girls. Well, you know, this, this kind of, huh? Invest in teachers, support disadvantaged schools, Delay the sorting process. Maybe they would do better even in Hogwarts if they delay the sorting process. <laughs> and breaking down the stereotypes. You know, when the uh, Ghostbusters became Ghostbusteress or whatever the word is, uh, uh, it was not well received by all the ones who had seen the saga of the first three or whatever Ghostbuster movies. Um, well, because they just kind of took it for granted that if you are going to be a Ghostbuster in your life, you have to be a man, you know? It's a, something which is kind of reserved. Huh? Well, it's not. And uh, uh, so the question of breaking down stereotypes, increased student awareness. This is about information. There is insufficient awareness about the opportunities and even the remunerations to entice more of the girls who are as or more talented than the boys in every other discipline to say, well, we'll go for a higher remuneration for my trials and tribulations, just to give enough information about the options. I know typically a public uh, nursing or medical career will perhaps pay less than a private Engineering. Well, if you're into the vocation of serving the others, you'll still go into uh, nursing or medical school. And if you were into maybe maybe a better living, and you got the talent, the option is you know at least have the information. No, make it available. So, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, the objective is clear: to ensure that every child, whatever his or her background, benefits from a quality education. The need is urgent. We're facing high levels of youth unemployment, deepening inequality, growing disenchantment, rising populism, rising political fragmentation, and then these perhaps now more understandable results that we see every day and that we wonder what is going on. So we know what we need to do. Not rocket science, but it needs political will, it needs some investment, it needs some change of the systems. And we have no time to waste because it's only about the future of our children. 
and that cannot waste, cannot wait. So the OECD stands ready to support all countries to reflect on the findings of PISA 25, 2015. This is not a set of statistics. You know, it's got, it's got you know, just millions of statistics. It's, a, it's an extraordinary undertaking. I am in awe every time I roll this out. And it's my third, is it, right? Um, and, and, uh, and the more, you know, the whole, of, the whole of next year, we're gonna be rolling this out in every country. Um, it, but it's about policies. It's, these numbers have to whisper in your ear. They have, to, they have to suggest what the best policies are because we already know what works. Because we know that it works better in some places rather than in others. So it's not, again, about a discovery trip. It's basically about, well, maybe a discovery trip if you take a charter plane uh, to uh, go and see some of these countries. Actually, uh, I read a report about a book called Cleverlands about a lady who, is she here? You're the author? Yes. Oh, my God. Well, what she did, let me, let me just give, give a little bit of propaganda, you know. Uh, what, what she did, as, as far as I read in the review, is that she saw the result of these earlier uh, PISA tests, and then she said, well, why do all these countries systematically do better? And then she actually went there, but not only went there to take notes and interview people, she went there to work as a teacher in all these systems, and then made the comparisons. And in the, end, in the beginning, this was the expectation that some of this is a culture question. So you can't replicate culture. No, you can't all be Singaporeans. You can't all be, you know. But he said, no, there's, yes, there is culture, but there's also a, no, a number of, let's say, best practices in all these systems that, that you know, are present there and therefore their better performance. So it's an extraordinary uh, uh, opus, uh, if I may say so, because it came out of curiosity of interest in a particular subject and then researching it the hard way and really producing very, very good, uh, very good uh, results. Um, it adds to the Amanda Ripley one about the smartest kid in the class or something like that, as it was called. Um, Amanda Ripley is the one who interviewed us in the town hall meeting when we rolled out three years ago or six years ago, I don't remember, three years ago. So uh, we stand ready at the OECD to support all countries to reflect on the findings of PISA 2015, as I said, to design, to develop, and to deliver better education policies for better lives. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's uh, very hard to remember our lives in 2006 when we focused last time on science on PISA. One thing is we didn't have the iPhone yet. No? We didn't have web streaming. We didn't have Android. No? A lot of things have happened, but actually very little has changed in science learning outcomes. No? Science and technology continue to race ahead. You know, think about social media, crowdfunding, drones, virtual reality, 3D printing. And the world continues to change. No? Robotics, big data, cloud computing, bioengineering, all of those things. Sorry, someone has moved the projector. All of these things have happened, but learning outcomes, as Secretary General Gurria said, have remained flat. But, and this is a big but, we have seen very impressive changes in some of the countries. No? Countries like Japan or Canada have delivered consistently strong outcomes. But you can see here, Portugal moving from poor to adequate. Singapore moving from good to great. Now, those countries keep improving, moving the needle. So the story is not throughout negative. Unfortunately, most of the improvements actually happen outside the industrialized world. I think that's also very important. So I want to just spend a few more minutes to highlight some of the success stories in education that we've seen. This is a summary 
On the vertical axis, you see the performance of countries. On the horizontal axis, you see equity. And this is the map. Some countries are successful in combining high levels of quality with an equitable distribution of learning outcomes. So quality and equity can go together. Excellence and equity. Some countries struggle with both. Not doing well and actually having large disparities. Here are some countries that do well on average, but still leave a lot of students out. And despite the very strong performance of Singapore, that is still a challenge for Singapore, no? closing the achievement gap. And some countries are delivering similar service to students, but not very good services. No? So you can actually see how the map really works. And we often hear this is all about culture and context. You know, you can't really change those things. But if that would be true, you'd see the same picture every year, every three years, every decade. But I want to highlight some really encouraging improvements. Think about Colombia, no? lifting the performance. No? Unfortunately, they've been lifting the performance of the privileged kids faster, so they moved a little bit to the left side, but they moved upwards. Or think about Norway, no? a country that is still an underperformer because they spend a huge amount of education and should be at the right at the top, but they've been moving. Or Portugal. Romania. No? There's been even more success in closing the achievement gap. No? You can see here Mexico. No? Not raising average performance, unfortunately, but being successful in mediating inequality. Or look at Slovenia, same story. The biggest improvements in equity we've actually seen in the United States. No? A country that hasn't you know, risen to the top, as you would hope for, but actually it's focused relentlessly over the last decade on the most disadvantaged students. You can see the needle changing, and other countries as well. So there are countries that have been moving. In fact, you know, when you look at this across countries, here I map performance by social background. You can see here in the Dominican Republic, the red square are the students from the 10% of the most disadvantaged background that Secretary General Gurria talked about. The green triangle are the students from the disadvantaged. And then you can see how student social background plays out across countries. You can see how differently children from similar backgrounds perform depending on where they go to school. This is a challenge that we have in education. Right? It's not where you come from. It's where you go to school that makes such an enormous difference. And as you have heard, you, know, you look at the 10% of the most disadvantaged students in countries like Vietnam, in countries like Estonia, in countries like Hong Kong, systems like Hong Kong. And as you've heard before, they are doing better than the most privileged kids in many other countries. Again, this is a powerful illustration how much more we could achieve if we were able to attract the most talented teachers to the most challenging classrooms and make sure that every child benefits from excellent teaching. Huge differences in the performance gap across the world. So what's behind it? Secretary General Gurria has already said it's not about money. No. It's about how we use our resources. <coughs> it's also not about student learning time, and this is where the story gets really interesting. Of course, within each country, if you add more time, you get better outcomes. Now, the students who have more science lessons are showing better outcomes. No. Within each country. But you look at this across countries, and you can see the relationship turns out negative. No. Some of the countries with the Shortest school days turn out to be some of the strongest performers. Look at Finland, look at Japan, look at Germany, Switzerland, Netherlands. So what's going on here? You go into a country and you see you add more time, you get better outcomes. You look at this across countries and that relationship disappears. Well, the answer to the productivity puzzle is that learning outcomes are always the product of the quantity of learning time and the quality of educational opportunities. And there is a lot more variability in the quality of learning than there is in the quantity of learning across countries. You can see that very nicely on this chart. This is basically study time in school and out of school. And you can see countries vary on it. And then we can measure productivity. That's basically outcomes relative to study time. And you can see some of the countries on the left side, you know, Finland, Germany, Switzerland, Japan, not teaching so much, but per hour delivering very strong outcomes. You see other countries on the right side, you know, that are, have long school dates 
Sometimes I'm, I'm not so productive. So it is a quality, it's about the quality of outcomes. It's about making science learning more effective and more engaging for students. It's about ensuring that learning time is more productive. There's so much we can win by using student learning time better. And our data show this isn't mainly about, you know, science laboratories or even more hands-on inquiry-based learning. Actually, some of what some countries consider very modern approaches to science teaching doesn't relate to better outcomes on the PISA test. What we learn from the best performers very consistently is that success is very much about clear, <coughs> well-structured, informative lessons. It's about classroom debates. It's about students' questions. It's about adapting lessons to student learning needs. That's the magic key that we see in the highest performing countries. But there's another puzzle. If you take the, put the data on performance together with what students tell us about their future, you can see that in some of the high performing countries, I put them to the right, students do really well on the science test, but they don't want to become scientists. No. That's true in Korea, that's true in Japan, that's true in Finland, that's true in China, that's true in Germany. So doing better on science doesn't guarantee that this is something that you see is relevant to your future, that's going to open life opportunities to you. And interesting in the US, no? students love science. They all want to become scientists, but they lack the knowledge and skills to live up to their dreams. So there is a gap between the aspirations of students and their knowledge that they bring with them. What's the answer to this? One part of the explanation is student attitudes towards science. They believe in the methods of scientific inquiry and their enjoyment of the subject. That is what helps to translate better proficiency in a stronger aspiration. Show you this on this chart. If you do not like science and you do better on the PISA test, you move on the right side, you are more likely to, be a, to want to go to a science career. No? That's true. But if you believe in the methods of science, if you enjoy science, that relationship is dramatically amplified. No? So that is very, very important. It's not about success on a science test. It's about engaging students and making science learning relevant, making them think like a scientist. That is what is the key to success. That is what translates better outcomes in better careers. So let me just wrap up. I want to be really brief. There are countries that do well on the science test. There are countries where students believe in the approaches of science. And there are countries where students want to become scientists but they don't always line up. No. There's a group of countries where you can see it all works together. Singapore, by large margin, at the top. Canada, doing well. Slovenia. Australia, UK, Ireland, more mediocre over outcomes, but still, the triangle goes together. Ireland, Portugal. No. You have countries like Chinese Taipei, or systems like Chinese Taipei, Hong Kong, New Zealand, and Denmark, there you can say, they're doing well, they believe in science, but they still want to, don't want to do it. You have a whole list of countries that do really well in science, but science education has not succeeded in making this relevant for their own life, to making this a dream for their own future, and to make them believe in the methods of science. We call those things epistemic beliefs. No? The United States I already mentioned, but also Spain, Israel, the United Arab Emirates, no? Students believe in science. They want to become scientists, but they miss the left part, good science education. And then you have a whole list of countries in the blue circle where you know students aspire to scientific careers, and that has increased. There are more children now than ever before that understand the importance and relevance of science for their own lives. But you know, they haven't been able to live up to this. They haven't got the opportunities, and they haven't been taught science in a way that is relevant. So let's put all of this together. But the good part is there is a group of countries that has somehow got the balance right for the moment. Very last point, how is the future going to look like? I, we talked very much about equity. We talked about overall performance. Let's have one last look on excellence in education. Let's look at the global pool of top performing students. 
The United States is a big part of the cake. No? Why? Not because the United States has a high share of top performing students. It's only 8%, 8.5%. The US education system doesn't produce a lot of excellence in relative terms. But the United States is a big country. So you add it up and you get a lot of people. Here, this is more interesting. Four provinces in China alone, Beijing, Shanghai, Jiangsu, Guangdong. Four provinces deliver 13.6% of the world's top performing students in science. Not because they have too many people, they also have many people, but they have a high density of excellence in the education system. <coughs> Lots of students really, really doing well. <coughs> Japan, even better in terms of producing excellence and also a big system. That is about half of the world's top performing students at the elite. And remember, this is not the whole of China. These are just four of the provinces. Then you take Germany, adding to this, you're over half, and the rest of the world. That's basically the global pool of tomorrow's engineers in science those who do well in school today. And I'll leave it here so that if we, we have enough this time for discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you to uh, both the Secretary General and to you, Andreas, for that very detailed, passionate uh, presentation full of um, modern cultural references there, which I think many of us enjoyed. Um, we've got around maybe 15 minutes or so for, uh, for questions before I think the Secretary General in particular needs to go, and I'm sure people would welcome a coffee. Um, so I'll take you at the front. If you could say who you are and who you represent. And just more specifically, can you do a broader overview? Uh, the Secretary General talked about kind of um, the difference between beliefs and what people want to go into and in, in perhaps different in interests. But is the gender gap closing across the board? And w what can we learn from the countries that are doing it well? Thank you. I'll, I'll just say something. Yes, it is closing, but for the wrong reasons. Uh, does, boys are doing a little worse. Um, and um, the girls are, are kind of holding, um, uh, maybe improving a bit. But yes, there is, there is a trend towards uh, uh, a, a closing of the gap. Um, but uh, as I said, there are still, in, in essence, what you have is a sorting, a tracking. But that doesn't uh, start at, in the school uh, when you're, you know, uh, 11 or 15 or whatever, <laughs> depends on each country. It starts at home. So that's, that's something which you have to really fight, the, the stereotyping. We in the OECD pushed, and this is the work of uh, EDU, of the Education Directorate and, and others, we pushed for the so-called 25 for 25, which is a reduction of the 25, of, by 25% by of the existing gap in labor participation between men and women by 2025. That means in 10 years, reduce. Now, what is 25%? Well, if the gap is 50%, as it is in some extreme cases, um, then that's 12 and a half that you have to reduce in 10 years. Uh, it started two or three years ago, so it was really 12 or 13 years. Um, and, and if it's four, because it's almost parity, then you have to reduce one. <laughs> so the idea was to reduce whatever, one fourth of whatever the, the gap was. Uh, but we, 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 we really have a special case here, a difficulty in the case of science, because that there's a much more meaningful, and much more visible uh, um, difference here. And that is why the focus on this uh, has to be you know, more targeted. Just one addition, if you look at the average student, education has been so successful in closing the gap in student performance between boys and girls. As soon as you put a magnifying glass over that, you see huge gender gaps remaining. First of all, among the top performing students. No? Boys are much more likely to be top performers and we have seen very little improvement over that. But as soon as you look at 
beyond science performance, at the attitudes, expectation, the belief in methods of science, at career expectations. That's where the real gender gaps appear. You see. And that's why, you know, when you map PISA to what we see in, you know, college entry, university entry, or occupational choices, that's where you see those gender gaps playing out. Even boys and girls who come out similarly on the PISA test have just very, very different career ex expectations, and we've seen very little change on that. So education has done well in closing the gender gap on the things that we measure, you know, test performance. Education hasn't done well in overcoming those kinds of underlying patterns, really. Thank you. Anyone else? Greg. Um, great question, this one. Could I ask Andreas about academic selection? Uh, Greg Hurst from The Times. Could I ask Andreas about academic selection? As you know, the British government uh, is consulting on expanding grammar schools, selective schools in England. What is the international evidence on the efficacy of selective schools, particularly with improving outcomes for disadvantaged students? One of the things that we see very clearly and consistently across the PISA cycles is that the more academically selective you want to be or are, the more socially selective you inevitably become. So academic inclusion and social inclusion relate very closely. The, the pattern on that is very clear. So the earlier you select students, the more profound the impact of social background. That being said, you know, keep in mind two things. Currently, England is one of the least selective systems across the OECD when you look at this at the school level. As soon as you zoom into schools, actually, there is more streaming going on in England today without the grammar schools than in any other country for which we have comparative data. So actually, you know, looking just at grammar schools is a, is a surface of the issue, but there's a lot of separation of students that happens between students, between classes. In fact, you know, in, in England, only about, actually less than 30% of the performance variation lies between schools. I know you put a high premium on, you know, school choice, all of those kinds of things. But the big story is hidden behind, you know, the differences in performance of individual students, individual teachers, and individual classes. That's where the performance gap really lies. So, yeah, you know, in increasing stratification of any sort is going to likely to amplify the impact of social background. But, you know, don't forget to look, you know, beyond the surface in what happens in classrooms and schools. Thank you. Lady at the back, <coughs> please, Gerard. Hi, uh, Lauren McEvitt from Morpeth Consulting Limited. Um, in recent weeks, Finland has announced a move away from subject-specific teaching in the next 10 years in its education system. Do you feel the PISA ranking system is resilient enough to face a whole-scale revolution in the way that subjects are approached within the international community? You know, we want students to be able to think across disciplinary boundaries. Now, that is clearly an objective that you hear in many countries. There's a big question whether this is best achieved by teaching this across the subject disciplines. I think the Finland, the jury is still out whether the, the Finnish approach of, you know, approaching this in the instructional system, putting a greater emphasis on project-based learning across that subject is, is going to play out in better performance. I'm not going to make any bet of this. Uh, one of the things that PISA data showed today is, you know, take a country like Singapore that is actually quite traditional in the way it focus it has rigor, high levels of cognitive demand, it has focus teaching few things really well with clear focus on conceptual understanding, coherence, meaningful learning progressions, and at the end of the day, students are very creative thinkers. They can extrapolate from what they know, apply their knowledge in novel fields across the different disciplines. So whether we should go the Finnish route, you know, they're trying it out. And I think the great thing is that, you know, the world is an amazing laboratory. We have countries trying out different things and we can study to what extent those policies are going to be successful. But in this case, you know, I don't think the answer is clear yet. Thank you. I'm going to take the lady at the back and then come over to you, Chris, if that's okay. <coughs> Uh, thank you. I'm Celia Dignan. I'm from the National Union of Teachers. Um, as you may be aware, we've got a serious teacher recruitment and retention crisis um, in England. And I notice in PISA that you do emphasise the need for national governments to attract and retain the highest quality teachers and to give them opportunities throughout their teaching careers uh, for self-development and to pay them well and to show them respect. 
Um, I wonder if you've got um, any more messages, particularly for the UK government, in terms of what it needs to do to ensure that these um, conditions are in place to, um, to, 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 to make sure that we have the qualified teaching workforce that our children need. Well, uh, I would quote you uh, to pose the question. You said, better pay, uh, you know, selection and retention through merit, uh, payment that is related to performance, and then respect, and then uh, no, 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 no performance, no performance. Okay, well, that's, I add that one. Um, uh, uh, why, uh, now, I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, and, and you said respect. Uh, I, this part of the respect, let me tell you, I come from Mexico. I'm, I'm from a, a developing country where it used to be that every family would aspire to have a son who would become a teacher. Especially, you know, that, that would get kind of a quality, like a, 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 a sign of great a great, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in the teacher had a great standing in the community and it was considered to be. That today, uh, maybe because it's a much more complex labor market, but has been lost. And uh, that kind of respect that you mentioned, I'm going to go to the other extreme, Finland. In Finland, the recruitment process for the teachers is very strict. The qualifications are very high that apply for one opening, you know, there'll be 100 or 150 with, with a master's degree, etc. And the pay is absolutely comparable to any other profession, as we believe it should be, because uh, you are having perhaps a much more delicate product to deal with than a factory or a machine. And that is the future of our children. Uh, and basically, uh, that unfortunately is not replicated uh, as often as it should be. Uh, and, and therefore you get, well, the Finlands of this world really shoot up, uh, but not necessarily become the norm. Uh, so I would say everything that you mentioned, I added, I perhaps, uh, I uh, apologize for, not, for misquoting you because I added the question of uh, performance-related uh, 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 stimulus, I would say performance-related, uh, rather than just time, uh, hap, hap, you know, time uh, uh, accruing. Uh, but all these elements that you mentioned would, I believe, if applied in practice, uh, generally uh, be, uh, you, you mentioned, for example, the capacity to improve oneself professionally over, you know, as you are working. And that is absolutely crucial. The, the, the concept of lifelong learning in a teaching career becomes crucial. And then it becomes part of the performance and therefore allows you to improve, uh, et cetera. So yes, I would say that those elements that you mentioned are absolutely crucial. There are also some other elements that have to do with mobility. <coughs> For example, many of the very successful systems we have observed will send their best teachers to the more problematic and more challenging school districts or schools individually. And what will happen then is that after a while, in the case of China, for example, they were A, B, C, D, and E or something like that. In the, after you know, a generation, what happened is that the last two levels disappeared. Why? Because they were having this, this uh, 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 circulating system where the best teachers would go to the, best, uh, to, to the more problematic schools. And then what happened is that you have a leveling upwards of the quality of the teaching of the schools. And that establishes a kind of a minimum uh, threshold. In many cases, there, is, there are mobility issues either because of housing situations or because in some cases because of, of uh, you know, the, the profession itself or uh, sometimes uh, because of the uh, 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 contract, contractual uh, situations, etc. But that's another uh, of the elements. The other elements have to do with the flexibility. How free, free is the teacher 
in the, in the, we mentioned this in my presentation, how free is the teacher in the classroom? The teacher should be kind of the king of the classroom rather than somebody who's mechanically just going through the whole, the whole, the whole thing. So uh, there you are, some, some, some additional elements. Just one sort of word on the, on the UK here. When you look at student staff ratios, actually things look okay. Uh, the UK is pretty, doing pretty well on that. When you ask principals, they consider shortage of qualified staff one of the most serious concerns in the, in the PISA study. So there is a clear perception that there is severe teacher shortage in, the, in, in England in this. And uh, how do you sort of answer that puzzle? Well, part of it is that you have uh, teaching teachers have very little time to do other things than teaching in the case of England. The question is not just about making teaching materially more attractive. On that front, England is doing pretty well on that. It's probably more a challenge of making teaching intellectually more attractive. It's about you know, more attractive careers. It's about better support. It's about a higher degree of pro professional collaboration uh, together combined with more professional autonomy. So those are very, very important questions to, to ask. You know, you have made a choice to prioritize smaller classes, and what has been left out is to give teachers more room for investing in their own careers, in their own future. You look at the highest performing countries around the world, whenever they have to choose between a better teacher and a smaller class, they go for the teacher. Thank you. I think there's time for one more. Chris Cook at the back, I think, was waiting to get in. No? OK, then Edwards. I just wanted uh, to ask you to expand on the graph about funding. Um, it seems to imply that the flat line, if you increase funding, you don't get the results. Um, presumably, there are caveats that will explain that. Uh, that was a question about funding. Yeah, yeah you're absolutely. Well, we, we, you don't need a microphone. <laughs> 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 When you look at this overall, that's what you see, basically. More money per student isn't relating to better outcomes across countries. But there are caveats to this. When you look at the highest performing countries, they're just so much better at, at directing the money where funding can actually make a difference. And most of the high performing countries, we now have some kind of formula-based funding. You know, where the, there are methods that ensure that students in the disadvantaged communities get the additional resources that they require. The different ways of doing this it can be done to so teacher careers, funding mechanisms is one of the things, you know, getting the money to where it actually can make a, a big difference. There is the big question of spending choices. You know, you can spend every pound only once, unfortunately. Yeah? You can spend it on better teacher salaries, you can spend it on smaller classes, you can spend it on more student learning time, or you can more spend it on more instruction time. And what we see very clearly is that high performing countries consistently invest the money on what makes a difference in the classroom. And uh, we take the United States, a high spending country, but only every second dollar arrives actually in the classroom. You know, that is, yeah. So I think it's about how resources are getting invested, where we could be so much more productive in education. You could see the chart basically on productivity. It's not just about learning. It's about the quality of the learning environment. And uh, those kind of spending choices uh, matter a lot more than the total volume of, of funding. We've, uh, we've been effectively on a campaign to defend education funding in the time, because we do, you know, we, we do many disciplines, you know, macro and stability and finance and budgets, it's one of them. And then, of course, we have health and we have education and we have taxes and we have science and technology and we have others that we look at. But we've been trying to keep education away from the so-called fiscal consolidation, which means the austerity drive, the, the cutting, because we recognized that it was necessary to do fiscal consolidation after the crisis. But the question is, where do you adjust? And then there's the other question that uh, Andreas was mentioning. Within the overall budget, even in the same budget, if you keep the budget, the envelope stays the same, how do you actually allocate that? There's some pretty basic issues, you know. Typically, you say, okay, well, you know, we give more money to the children. You, you spend about, what, about five or six times more in universities than you spend in, uh, in primary. But the problem is the age is moving upwards. The problem is moving from primary to secondary to high schools. And we're insisting that they go back to pre-school education uh, as a very crucial part, which was underfunded and where sometimes there was a daycare center, but you'd go broke. 
uh, you sometimes have long, long, long lines, even in countries like Australia, for example, you know, the fairly developed. Uh, and then, and then you have to, you go broke because you have to pay so much for the children to go to. So there's a combination of the allocation the opportunity and the, the, the infrastructure and the choices. But then, in a way, you could say we're very proud that in this 10-year period, even although the crisis intervened, there's been an increase of 20%. I mean, that's pretty big because every other item practically has gone down. However, again, what we see is that we have a problem of allocation choices to make it work better. Thank you very much. I think uh, that's all the time we have for questions. Um, can I just uh, ask everyone to um, give um, the Secretary General and Andreas a round of applause for coming here today and being so <laughs>
if I could ask you to um, take your seats and perhaps uh, move a bit further to the front, if that's okay. Uh, I think we've got one or two people wandering in. But why don't we make a <coughs> start? So we had a really interesting um, uh, couple, set of presentations from the OECD earlier this morning about the overall findings from PISA. And we began to, uh, through the earlier Q&A, um, un unearth some of the key issues that arise from that in relation to UK practice and in relation to science. What we'd like to do is use the panel discussion now to probe those findings even further um, uh, on those issues and more. So I'm really delighted to be able to uh, welcome such an esteemed uh, panel today and they'll give their perspective on what PISA means for both policy and practice. So uh, starting from this side of the panel, um, Yvonne Baker, who is the director of the uh, National STEM Centre and the uh, centre offers CPD for teachers, resources, role models in science and after school clubs and a whole host of other things related to supporting and encouraging uh, teaching and learning in science. Um, next to uh, Yvonne, we have Rosalind Mist, who is the head of education policy at the Royal Society. And the Royal Society, for those of you that don't know, is a fellowship of many of the world's most eminent scientists and is dedicated to promoting excellence. Um, in the middle next to Rosalind, we have Amanda Spielman. Amanda is the newly appointed Chief Inspector of Schools and Children's Services, and she'll take up post there in January, following, I think, a five-year spell as Chair of the Exam Regulator Ofqual. We then have uh, Brett Wigsdorf, I hope I pronounced your name okay, um, who's founder and CEO of Teach First. Um, I'm sure most of you will have heard of Teach First, um, who since launching in 2002 have placed over 5,000 teachers with more, more than 1 million young people from low-income communities. And finally, we have Russell Hobby, who has been General Secretary of the National Association for, uh, of Head Teachers since 2010, and the NAHT represents uh, almost 30,000 <coughs> school leaders across England, <coughs> Wales, and Northern Ireland. So thank you all again for being on the panel. Um, I'm going to start off using Chair's privilege by asking the panel member one or two questions, and then we'll bring in um, members of the audience for, for some follow-up questions. Um, so an easy one first. Um, how important are international benchmarking tests and what can we learn from them? And if we go from left to right. Um, I think they are important because they give us a, um, a, 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 a look into what other countries are doing. We compete with other countries in many ways. Um, commercially, we co collaborate with countries in many ways as well on scientific research and things like that. So it's very important to know where we where we stand. Um, I think it's also important to, you know, have a good view of the the more rounded uh, picture that Andreas particularly was giving us about how engaged young people are in different countries uh, with the thought of a science-related career, for example, with the thought of a maths-related career, um, you know, that they do in in sort of different years. Uh, because that's actually the, uh, there's a lot of, of talk about the pipeline, and I'm not a big fan of this idea of a leaky pipeline of skills, particularly in science, but actually, the, you know, we do need, we do know that every um, economy needs more and more young people in, in, with those skills to enter the workforce. Thank you. So I think the independent nature of the international test is really important, and um, particularly the, the data not just about the attainment, but what students are experiencing in the classroom and the views of principals all in one place. But I think for me the really interesting bit is going to be getting behind that data and, and seeing what it tells us about the science education, the maths education in the classroom and what teachers and others can take from that. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Um, I think they're very important, but um, I would say, what would you expect somebody with a master's in comparative education to say? <laughs> um, but more seriously, they help us get out of our own bubble. They help us recognise things that may not be obvious when we look only in our own national context. So in the context of PISA, I think it's a, a perennial reminder that our bottom 10, 15, 20 percent do, do so badly in reading and maths compared with 
many comparable countries. That, that is a useful reminder. Um, and it, it's also useful because it helps remind us that there is no single authoritative source. Um, triangulating data from a lot of different sources gives better information, better perspectives, and ultimately better policy making, better action. I'd, I'd agree. I, th I think they are very important. I mean, I'm a big fan of, I think, Andreas and, and Pisa over the last 15 years have brought data into education policy making in a way that um, it just really didn't exist uh, be before that period. And I think, it, you know, it's very exciting now over time to actually just get thousands and thousands of pages of data that policymakers and others can use to actually see um, different ways that education systems work or don't work, actually really understand some of the different changes happening around the world. Um, and I think, you know, from a broad point of view, what it shows, which you can see, is that there are some education systems in the world that are just world class, that are doing things in a, in a much stronger way than England, and uh, some of these countries where we have a lot to learn from. But at the same time, you know, England has a, has a good education system that's doing well and above average. Um, we still have a long way to go to get to that top level. Thank you, Russell. There's a sense in which um, the importance is a self-fulfilling prophecy of this. If we treat them as if they are important, then they become uh, important, and very significant policy decisions are made on the back of uh, PISA results, uh, and there are transformations within the education system. So clearly we have to take seriously what is said, but also we shouldn't read too much uh, into the data either, and just borrowing wholesale from particular education systems can be very dangerous as well. It, it may come into another question, but there is this issue about how well we spend our money and how effective implementation is. And I think if you just take, oh, here's something that works well in Singapore or Shanghai, and we'll just do the surface of it in, in our own country, you'll see very weak results. So for me, this data can only be the start of an investigation. It can tell you what questions to ask. Mm. Um, you can't just jump to conclusions from it. Thank you. Uh, and just one final one, perhaps, to Amanda and Russell about UK performance. Um, I think it's fair to say that overall, the UK performs at around average, um, but its performance has been fairly stagnant over, uh, well, essentially since, since the beginning of, of PISA. Why do you think that might be? So, do you want to go first, Russell? Russell? Okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, I mean there are certainly, there's certainly good news within that for our education system on, on face value. The results for science, uh, and particularly that Venn diagram of, of that sort of sweet spot of, yeah. uh, of get, giving people skills, but also inspiring people to do it, is something to be, to be really proud of. But the, the, the movement overall for our system is not, is not visible. Um, and I, I, I'm going to do exactly what I, I warned of just a moment ago. I'm going to jump to a conclusion uh, on the basis of the, the data. But it's too soon to read conclusions into the reform of our examination and qualification system from this data. I don't think it's too soon to draw some conclusions about the uh, structural transformations that we've, that we've engaged in, the emphasis that we've put on changing the governance and structure of our education system rather than investing in uh, what was described as great teaching, great teaching, great teaching. Um, and I think you know, the government sets a kind of three-year horizon for a school to turn its performance around. Uh, we've transformed thousands of schools into academies and we have a three-year window to look at the results of this. I think it suggests that we've been paying attention to the wrong things in our education system, not the drivers of high performance. Thank you. Amanda? Um, Russell's made some excellent points there. Um, and in particular, that these results are from people who've been through the old national curriculum and the old qualifications. They tell us nothing at all about new curriculum and qualifications, and that's one of the frustrations of a five-year cycle. It's normally feeding us back information, not about the current, but the previous. Um, I think more generally it shows how hard education reform is. It's not just about doing one thing, it's about the orchestration of a number of things, each of which is difficult to implement and make happen all the way through, through, through a system. Um, so it, I think it's a reminder to us not to expect easy answers and quick solutions. Thank you. And Russell, uh, you raised the point about the Venn diagram. I'm going to bring in uh, Rosalind and Yvonne later to talk uh, specifically about that. We at EPI love a good Venn diagram, so we'll come back to that. Um, but I'll take some questions from the audience first, I think, if anyone would like to start. The front here. We've got a microphone coming. Thank you. I'm Hilary Lucas from the Wellcome Trust, and um, I'd just love to hear a little bit more about teachers and teaching and the role that they might play in this. And um, I think the discussion around class size um, is very interesting. And actually, if we look at where we sit 
on the sweet spot, I think we're doing very well despite the fact that we know that we have huge teaching shortages. Um, and I wonder where we could get to if we just focused our efforts on, on fixing that teaching problem. I also note that in the TIMS data from last week, actually Singapore performed extremely poorly on teacher satisfaction and teacher turnover. And I think, you know, this, this danger of um, taking the, the good information about a country, but also um, understanding the context that it comes from, because that certainly isn't something that we would want to mm. be importing into our system. Okay, thank you. Brett, do you want to kick that one off? Sure. I mean, um, so I think that, uh, from what I saw the data, I mean, yeah, well, and also there's definitely, you know, a situation in England where there's a shortage of STEM teaching. And, and one of the things that the PISA data and, and we talked about this morning was the importance of teachers, the importance of great teaching, the importance of great continuous professional development for teachers. Um, and I know there's some points that remain in the data how some of these top systems, I mean, it's interesting, Singapore, I mean, Singapore, I think, does have some of the best CPD in the world for teachers from what I've seen and some of the best teacher training. Um, and I'd be interested, I didn't see that in the TIMS data, but, um, but you do see that, I think, in Canada is another really high-performing system here where they're very good at getting teachers to work together um, and, uh, and some very good CPD for teachers. Um, so, you know, I think one of the points made this morning also was that it's not the total amount of money spent, but it's that, how is that money spent wisely? So, you know, money spent wiser on, on attracting STEM teachers, but then keeping them in the profession, helping them continuously learn, I think is another point made in the report that science teachers need to continuously develop even, even more than in other fields because it's such a fast changing subject. And I do think the best systems in the world do that really well, where they help the science teachers be real professionals who continuously learn and develop. And that's something where I think uh, England can continue to, to grow and, and um, improve. Thank you. Russell, any other points on teaching? Oh, yeah. Getting great teachers and supporting great teachers is reinforced in the report, but there is also some detail on the tools that you give teachers as well, and the, particularly the curriculum and the teaching methods in there. I don't think we can draw conclusions, as, as Amanda said, but it did, for example, point out in, in some of the volumes that um, taking the time to properly explain scientific concepts um, and not necessarily just relying on a discovery-based approach <coughs> to science is, seems to be correlated with the higher performing system. So I think some of that more philosophical debate around teaching methods and the overall approach that we have and whether you know, the drives that we have for entrepreneurialism, creativity and problem solving necessarily imply that we do all of that in the classroom at a very early age or whether those things grow out of a foundation of, of clear knowledge and concept building. Um, and I don't have the, the answer to that, but I think it points us in one of those directions. Thank you. Um, just going back to the Venn diagram, so uh, just to recap, what the Venn diagram showed is that the, the UK is one of seven countries at the centre of the Venn diagram when we consider performance in science, uh, belief and engagement of the value of science, and pupils who are working towards a um, science oriented or related career. I'm interested, uh, particularly from Rosalind and Yvonne, about which factors or teaching practices are most important in securing a place in the centre of that Venn diagram? Well, I think it's a, it's a whole mix, isn't it? I mean, it's teachers' subject knowledge, their pedagogical content knowledge, um, that it's developing that through, through good CPD, good experiences. But it's also, we know that actually the third biggest influence on young people in terms of career choices are actually subject teachers. You know, careers advisors don't tell them, but they come really, you know, sort of loaded. They come at the bottom of the list, basically. Um, you know, it's parents, it's friends, peers, family members, and then it's, and then it's subject teachers. So I think it's all about supporting teachers in getting, um, in real, building their own confidence, their own awareness of the things that employers are looking for, the opportunities that employers provide. Um, you know, a lot of teachers are doing that. We're helping a lot of teachers do that. And I think we also ought to celebrate the success of, of science teachers in particular um, in achieving, you know, getting the UK to the middle of that sweet spot. That has been hard won. Um, and I think, you know, yes, we can talk a lot about the fact that the, the schools have stagnated for science, but actually getting people to that point, which is where employers want us to be shortly, which is actually with more young people looking at science-related careers in a positive light, um, more young people having very positive attitudes towards science. Um, you know, we now need to build on that, um, but it's a great place to, to start from. Mm. Uh, sorry, Rosalind. There's something we've been looking at around the, the breadth of the curriculum as well in mm. that sweet spot, that we're, we're very lucky in the UK that you're studying biology, chemistry and physics until the age of 18. 
and then starting to think about how you capitalize on that group, how you translate them into students who are studying science and mathematics 16 to 18. And for me, there's something around the math skills and looking at how that math skills uh, research and how, the, how that crosses with the, the science attainment is really important because you can't capitalize on the science and how well you do in science at 16 unless you've got strong math skills as well. So I think we really need to look at how those two bits mm. fit together. Thank you. Um, any other questions from the audience at the front here? We've got a mic coming as well. Thank you. Uh, it's Ben Durbin from the NFER. Uh, a lot of the headlines from the findings are, of course, focus on the kind of average scores of each country. Um, now, I don't think any of us have ever met the average student. Um, so what that misses is that an underlying pretty wide variation in performance among different pupil groups, um, particularly by socio <coughs> uh, Does the panel feel that uh, our education system, as it's set up at the moment, in terms of the curriculum, in terms of uh, teaching, uh, every aspect of it, is equipped to address that issue of, of wide variations mm. in performance? Good question. Amanda? Um, I, point to, I found a very interesting recommendation on page 272, <laughs> which I thought was really worth thinking about in this context, um, where it said Finland, Japan, Norway and the UK are also high achievers with a weak relationship between socioeconomic status and performance, which is counterintuitive for most of us, but beyond universal policies, these countries may consider policies targeted to low performers who may not necessarily be defined by their socioeconomic status or to poor performing schools where differences between schools are large. So perhaps broadening our focus a bit beyond just socioeconomic status defined under performers to all low performers may be an interesting, interesting thing that this report prompts us to explore. But anybody reading a PISA report should have correlation is not causation sort of branded in flashing red letters at the top of every page. Um, so as Russell says, all, of the, all this does is to give us some lines to think about to explore. It does not give us um, any sort of clear, explicit direction on anything. Sorry, Thanks. Page was that? 272. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Simonic. Um, yes. Amanda uh, raised a very interesting and I think very topical point about um, where we focus our attention and should we be looking not necessarily away from the economically disadvantaged pupils, but also looking towards um, pupils who are performing badly but not, may not be so financially disadvantaged. Um, Teach First obviously uh, focuses its efforts in the economically disadvantaged pupils. What do you think are the relative merits of widening that somewhat? Yeah, um, so I mean, actually we have wind, uh, widened it over the years in different ways. We started as just a London initiative because London was the lowest performing area of the country when we started 15 years ago. Um, we're now at much more socioeconomic disadvantage, so we're prioritizing certain geographic areas of the country where, that are lower performing areas of the country, which, which fit with the, the um, government's opportunity areas that, that we're, we're very supportive of. Um, so I do think, I mean, historically the reason why we focus on um, economic um, disadvantages because that's been the biggest determinant of success or not success in Britain. And I think, you know, there's some nuggets, potentially green shoots of positive things I, I saw in this um, PISA report that show a bit of potential redu reduction in, in um, the gaps that exist between low socioeconomic and higher socioeconomic kids, which, which, which is positive because Britain used to be one of the worst countries in the world. And one of the graphs actually Andrea showed this morning with the science results, though it was interesting is the lowest um, lowest 10% decile of um, children socioeconomically are performing pretty much close to the OECD average in science results. And actually, it you know, wasn't that big a gap in science, which, which I thought was exciting, you know, based on where England's been in the past. So I think there's, there's some potentially good news. Some of that, I think, has to do with London effect, that um, so many low-income and free school meal kids live in London, and London is, is now doing quite well. And I think, you know, if London was pulled out, I think you would find it, it's, it's getting up there among some of the best systems in the world. Um, and I think some of it has to do with that there are, you know, more and more areas of the country that are feeling left behind by outstanding education systems. Systems. And, you know, I travel to some areas of the country where you don't really see too many outstanding schools. And, um, and many of the uh, schools there, you know, don't have outstanding examples near them. And, and they might have um, children there who aren't necessarily, you know, um, on free school meals. But, um, 
I think that lack of outstanding education in some parts of England, you know, that's something that's masked in the, in the piece of data that you don't necessarily see that there are areas of the country where the results, as you said, are much below average, even while other areas of the country might be far above average. Mm -hmm. Can I just Thank you. Yes, chip in on that? I mean, there's, you know, there's um, another um, angle looking at this, which is about this idea of self-efficacy, particularly for science and also for maths, I would suggest. Um, Professor Louise Archer has done a lot of work at King's College London about the concept of STEM capital, science capital. You know, how much do you identify yourself as a potential future scientist, a future user of STEM uh, subjects? And, you know, that, that's particularly young people who come from family backgrounds that, that haven't been involved in science activities, going to science museums, going to science centres, watching um, science programmes, seeing <laughs> mathematics as a good thing. And I think that's another area that we should really be thinking about because that could be, uh, you know, that could bring an awful lot of um, people up in terms of their, you know, seeing themselves as being those people who may work in science or may work with mathematics in future. That effect is particularly strong for girls. And I think that's something that we have a particularly sticky problem with in the UK and something we really need to think about as a society, not just as an education system. Thank you. Uh, I think there was a lady who wanted to come in from the audience. Did you have a question? Um, well, it, it was basically just one second for the so microphone. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Christine Oliver, Kasuma Trust. I think we started to talk about it, really. I wondered what the implications of the findings were for the North-South divide, um, whether that... I mean, it seemed to be that the presentation was actually saying it's more important to look within <coughs> schools in some mm. respects mm. because that's where the key variation are. Uh, but but we also are looking at a north-south divide, and it seems to me unlikely that the north has far fewer good teachers. Interesting. Uh, north-south divide, obviously very topical again at the moment. Russell, do you have any thoughts? Well, I, I think it, it does relate to the, the point that, that you touched on about the differences within school versus the difference between schools. Mm -hmm. And we seem obsessed within our system about the differences between schools um, and the north the, the tension to the north south divide i think is 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 part of that it's just easier to count and manage school level issues than it is pupil level issues from the center and uh, although uh, uh, at the same time that we've devolved a lot of autonomy to, to school leaders we've also centralized a lot of decision making around education as well what we've done is cut out the middle uh, within that and so managing it drives us to school level interventions but school level interventions seem to me that the data is suggesting that might not be the, the, the strongest route. The danger, I think, is, is that what levers do we have left to, to do interventions at, at the individual pupil and teacher level from the, from the centre? It's very hard to drive these, these sorts of things whenever we find a problem with the curriculum or a problem with teaching methods. It's very hard to get that to flow across our whole education um, system because of the level of autonomy that, that we've delegated. And we've put ourselves in a bit of a bind there, I think. Thank you. Amanda, the north-south divide was one of the core themes from Ofsted's annual report this year. Do you have any reflections on, on that? At this stage, it's a bit early, I think, for me to reflect on it, um, having not yet got full access, any access to the sort of Ofsted, Ofsted evidence base. Um, but clearly, it's something that I'll be picking up on, looking at the disparities. And as Russell says, I think the important thing is to have a view on whole systems and all the pieces, not to assume that everything is down to individual schools and the teachers within them. It's a, it's a bigger, more complicated system than that. So the, the, alloc it, the allocation of responsibilities and the interactions of different players are complicated and subtle things. Thank you. Um, any other questions from the audience? At the back there, Josh, please. Hi, I'm Sue Gray from UCL Institute of Education. And I've got um, a question about wider educational reform. I think it was Rosalind who said, uh, educational reform isn't always easy and I just wonder whether we've got into a situation in this country where we're constantly reforming education and that there's a discourse that we always need to be doing something to reform it it's very difficult then to evaluate what we've done because we change it so very often I've got three children who are only two years apart and they've all sat different GCSEs and will sit different A levels I think it's all very well having somebody coming in from outside and judging what's going on but if you're constantly changing, how do you know which bits are doing what? Mm. Would there be some argument just to let things be for a while and just see what happens? Interesting question. Before I think I come on to Russell, Rosalind, do you want to come in on, because uh, it stemmed from your point about education reform? 
I think I'd agree with everything you've just said. If you go back to look at um, the society in 2014, <coughs> looked at the science education, maths education system as a whole, and looked at all the component parts, as Amanda has been saying, there's, there's quite a lot that you need to look at together. And one of the things they came, the, the group that looked at it came out and said is, we need to look at evolution, not revolution, in the education system, to take things slowly, take things measured, and use the evidence base to inform what happens. So completely agree. Thank you. Russell. Yeah, I think if our, if our education system was an experiment, it would be a really badly designed one with lots of variables confounding each other all of, the, all of the time in this. And not only do we change the interventions, but we change the basis of measurement and the yardsticks we use on a regular basis uh, as well. So knowing what works, I think, is, is really difficult. It's partly why having international evidence is so helpful, because there are education systems out there that don't change everything uh, every three or four years as well, and we can see what happens. Um, I also think that Andrew Schleicher did say that staying the course and sticking to a long-term strategy is part of the success of, of, of these systems, that they have a 20-year vision um, for what they want to achieve. That's far easier done in a system without uh, elections on a regular basis, um, and I'm not sure we would want to go that far. So there are some policy prescriptions that you don't, you don't want to have. But, but if you have a constant change of political direction, you will have a change of education um, direction as well. But if we could stick to it for a bit longer, it seems to me that the real the changes that matter, which are in the quality of teaching, the pedagogy, the curriculum, they take a really long time to flow through, and we have to give them a chance to succeed. Thank you, Brett. Yeah, no, I'd agree. I mean, what, what struck me is I spent a bit of time looking at the Canadian system and the Singaporean system as two examples that scored extremely highly this time. And both of them had very, very long-term um, policies. You know, and Canada's obviously a democracy, Singapore less so. But both of them had, you know, 20-year policies that everyone sort of agreed on and they stuck to it. And um, especially Ontario, uh, one of the main areas of Canada. And um, it, it just felt like that was a major reason for their success. And when I was talking to Andreas, he, you know, one of his views was England is on that right path. I mean, I think that, that's his view, that, um, that a lot of the autonomy that we've given schools, he would say would be, uh, he was saying, was the um, you know, right path to give, uh, give schools this ability to succeed. And almost it needs to embed in different ways. Um, I think it's inter also the other interesting point is correlation versus causation, but you look at England versus the other nations, this is um, the results today, I don't know, no one's talked about it yet, but it is interesting to see England is performing higher than, um, than the other nations, than Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, and um, you know, what are some of the reasons behind that, is it different policy changes or other reasons, and um, I haven't heard anyone yet talk about that, but I, I think that's also an interesting rich discussion, it's almost an example of um, what, what's, what's different in each of the four nations that might have different results. Yeah, I think that's an incredibly interesting uh, topic. I think people are still digesting the, uh, the UK findings before uh, focusing down on England, but I'm sure that there will be, uh, that, there, that there are um, many more important messages in their national report for England, which I think the DfE published this morning. I'm getting the nod from the DfE. Um, <coughs> any other questions from the audience? In which case, I'd like to go back... I'll just uh, I'll, uh, start with science and then I'll come back to you if that's okay. Uh, so just going back to science, we heard um, both the General's, uh, Secretary, uh, Secretary General rather, and uh, Andreas use the term think like a scientist this morning, which is the slogan for um, PISA 2015. Um, but one of the themes that came out of the report was that actually the the importance and value of science is not always consistent across all countries, um, across pupils, and across teaching practices. So, do uh, my question to uh, Rosalind and Yvonne is: Do policy makers or governments need to do more to think like a scientist themselves? That's a nice one. Um, yes, but I think everybody in education needs to think more like a scientist. So that that's us in this room. That's the teachers. That's the press, the media. We all need to look at the evidence base and think much more like a scientist, analysing what we do and how we work. Um, I w yeah, I wanted to... We've been thinking about this quite a lot in, in the building, which is, is just over there, and with our sister academy, the British Academy, thinking about the education research landscape and how, how you could get to a, a system where everybody was thinking like a scientist or thinking like a researcher. And there are some things there around, for us, around having teachers who are confident in critiquing how, how, they, how they work and confident accessing 
education research literature. There's something around how you publish it, around open access to research literature and things like that. So I think it's more than just policymakers. I think it's everybody. Thank you. Yvonne? I agree um, with everything Ros said, but I also think it's policymakers and also funders need to think like a scientist and actually take the evidence into account, impact evidence. Um, because, again, it comes to this sort of slightly short-termist approach that we have. You know, people are always looking for the golden bullet, the better mousetrap, that will finally, for example, you know, make every, every second child want to become an engineer or whatever. Um, and we see lots of new initiatives springing up um, whereas actually there are things that are working, they can always be improved, we know that, but actually sort of build on the body of evidence that's there around the impact of things like the Science Learning Partnership, STEM Ambassadors, um, the Crest Awards, things like that. You know, there's a good body of evidence, start, evaluation evidence starting to come from some of these schemes. So rather than sort of, you know, running out on those and, and starting something new, backing what works. And I think that was one of the themes um, when I heard Andrea Schlaker talk uh, not so long ago. Um, you know, back what works. Um, help us improve it because we know it's not perfect. But let's, you know, be more like a scientist about constantly improving things. Um, I also have to stand up for the engineers here and say that we also have to get people to think like an engineer, which is thinking like a scientist, only probably with a little bit more testing, um, you know, sort of random testing. Oh, I'll get shot by the engineers now, but that's, um, you know. But I think that those engineering thinking skills, those scientific thinking skills, are, use, are what we want to build in everybody, regardless of, and every young person, regardless of what they go on to do in life. Thank you. Amanda? Well, yes, I'm, I'm the person who took a certain amount of heat from a select committee um, for expressing a very strong interest in evidence and data, but I am sort of acutely conscious coming into Ofsted that um, any accountability system needs to be built on very clear insight evidence data. Um, otherwise, there's a risk of making, make, make, making changes that, that do not help the system. So I've got to think about it as what mm. is going to help the system move forward. Mm. Yeah. Um, did you still have a question? Yeah. Okay, and then we'll go to the... Fine, okay. Uh, John Claughton, um, I, I know that um, we've decided that we're not very keen on change, um, and also these tests about 15 year olds. I just wonder whether um, consideration of the nation curriculum beyond 15, uh, the fact we have a very specialising education post GCSE, whether that is having an impact upon the number of people who are studying science, um, and whether that's an area which needs um, consideration. I know the Royal Society is very keen on a broad education post 16. Uh, and also whether the issues of actually um, bringing together the vocational and the academic better between mm. s from, s from 16 onwards. I know it's outside the 15-year-old thing, but perhaps the nature of the curriculum and the early choices people make does have an impact upon the perceptions of science amongst younger children. Mm. Yvonne, I'll come to you first on that. I, I think that's a very good point, and it's something that I, I think, you know, the Royal Society in uh, the recommendations for the vision in science and, science and mathematics education, as you say, uh, very strongly advocated for a broader education to um, uh, including science and maths to 18 for all young people. You talk to most other countries, I don't know statistically, but certainly most other countries have maths and some form of science in education for all young people to around 18 years of age. Um, and actually, I do, you know, we don't know, we will never know in, in some ways, but I do wonder whether that actually does act as this sort of break on young people's expectations. You know, you look at um, you know that you can drop these subjects at 16. Does that make you less engaged with them prior to that? Um, you go back to the work of Louise Archer. You know, there's very, very strong suggestions uh, that children's, and particularly girls' self-identification as somebody, somebody who may work in science actually goes on at around 11 years of age and possibly earlier. Um, but, you know, children are very well-informed about when they get to make choices and, and sort of have these options. Um, I do think it's something that we need to seriously consider and seriously look at. That's one of the things we can possibly learn from other uh, jurisdictions. Russell, do you have anything to add on uh, that point about post-16 and the often very fragmented routes between vocation, vocational and academic? Yeah, I mean, 
at some point, specialisation is inevitable in our, in our system, particularly if you want to pursue a career in this. You're going to have to dig down into an area and master that, that area. So we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be afraid of specialisation. It's when, it's, mm. when it happens that, that's mm. appropriate. And that, that as late as possible, it seems <coughs> to me to be a good idea, particularly up to 16, um, where I think a broad academic curriculum is the best foundation for both vocational and ac academic routes from then on. The, the real debate, I guess, is around the sixth form level of, of study and whether we're forcing choices too soon. And I think we probably are for those students who would wish to, to mm. pursue both, both strands of that. There are opportunities in things like the International Baccalaureate and others to, to do those, but they're not well rewarded within our, our education system. So I, I do think we are constraining some, some choices there for, for students who would like to do both humanities and science subjects. Any final questions from the audience before we wrap up? Oh, sorry, there's one more at the back. Uh, hi, Patrick Alexander. Um, I've been a teacher for 10 years um, after starting with Teach First. Um, I've actually re recently left the profession. Um, and, um, yeah, I, it, 10 years, it's, it's quite a long time. Um, I think... You're staying in education policy. <laughs> I'm just staying in education policy, hence why I'm here. But I think that um, my question would be about reform. It's very interesting, the question that came from the back about... Um, whether or not it's, it's wise to keep reforming. But if there, was a, if there were to be a headline um, reform about improving working conditions for teachers, would it not be the case that it would be a, a sort of self-selecting effect on, um, on the body of professionals so that you know, recruitment and, and retention just happens automatically because you know, teachers are happier, they want to stay in the, the profession? It seems to me if, if that reform happened, you know, I th and in my view it's quite urgently needed, then you'll be able to improve things quite quickly in this country. I wonder what the panellists thought of that. Interesting question. Brett? Yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, I think um, it's interesting. When, when I, I see some, I mean, I, mean I, I think there's two things. One is, I think the belief that people should become teachers and then stay in a school and retire 50 years later maybe isn't necessarily the right way to look at the entire profession. So I do sometimes worry people do have that sort of view that anyone who goes into teaching Success is only if someone then leaves the school 40 years later or 50 years later when they retire. Um, and I just think that's just not the way the workforce works today. It's not necessarily the way the workforce should work. And I think, you know, more ways for people to come in and out of teaching at different points in their career, that's not necessarily a bad thing. So that, that's the first thing I'd say. The second thing I'd say is I do think there's so much more we can do, and I think so much more the best systems do on just continuous professional development of teachers in a real professional way, not, you know, boring inset days, but actually helping teachers mentor each other, work, work together, be real experts in their profession. Um, you know, science teachers really understanding, um, understanding all the changes that are happening in the world of science. You know, and it, it, it's interesting, Singapore, um, um, I, I've seen a few teachers there who have professional development plans that are much better than I had when I was a management consultant at a top management consultancy. And in Canada, I was talking to teachers who had very good professional development plans who felt like they were really being treated like a profession. And um, I think that is something where we could do a lot better in England and it would have a huge effect on the system. Thank you. Amanda? Um, I think this is a very interesting question, and um, in Ofsted terms, thinking about it, it there, there, there's clearly something to explore about what we conceive of as good leadership and management. I mean, we have a highly devolved system, so, so, so the quality, the quality mm -hmm. of a teacher's, teacher's working life is very much determined by how teachers are led and managed, so I'll be thinking about that going forward. Russell, any final thoughts to add on, on that question? Yeah, I, I, I agree getting retention right makes recruitment easier because you need to recruit less. I think the TIMS data from a uh, previous study also showed that we had one of the least experienced teaching workforces in the, in the OECD as well. And if we're, we're te turning teaching into a profession where people of every, every age range cannot thrive in that, that's not good um, for our schools. But I'll, I'll put my trade union hat on, uh, on this one and say um, starting salaries do matter too. Uh, when it comes to recruitment, I know our teachers are not necessarily badly rewarded when, it, when you look at the more experienced thing of that, but I think signals to, to, to younger graduates when they look at other career options and look at what, the teach, what they can get within teaching, not the most important driver, and you can trade off between working conditions and salary, but they have slipped quite far behind what some of the other professions can offer. I can't see any easy way of solving that given sort of financial policies that we have, but we shouldn't ignore it as a factor. Thank you. Um, I'm going to wrap up the audience Q&A there and just ask the panel to reflect on one final question in 
in a single sentence. We talked a lot about science today. It's the year of, um, of science in PISA. What's the one single thing that you think government or the sector um, ought to do to promote greater gender equality in STEM? <coughs> I think it's looking at this concept of self-efficacy, particularly for girls, um, science capital, and actually how we help parents, um, society in general, uh, develop that in, in family life. Um, I think, you know, as um, was said earlier, home is where all these things mm. start. But we also need the help of the media in doing that as well, you know, uh, providing us with positive images about science, but also positive messages about girls and maths. Thank you, Rosalind. That plus um, looking at teacher professional development and unconscious bias and helping teachers recognise their own unconscious biases mm -hmm. and enabling students to recognise the unconscious biases that they have from their home environments and earlier in the school system. Thank you, Amanda. Um, keep, keep focusing on the decision points. We have an unusually large number of decision points at 13 or 14 and 15 or 16 and 17 or 18. Each of those is an opportunity for girls to drop out of drop out of science or the more advanced levels of mm. science, really keep working on those. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I would agree with everything that I've said so far. And uh, I mean, the one thing I'd add is, yeah, and also employability. I mean, we, uh, I've seen um, some schools that, that do this very well where the, the teachers or other staff are really also supporting girls and supporting every student to understand all the employment options out there at a very young age so that kids can make the right choices in GCSEs and A-levels, which a lot of young people in, in low-income communities struggle to make those choices because they're not aware of the uh, effect yeah. those choices might have. Yeah. Russell. Uh, yeah, all of that. And um, <laughs> don't wait till secondary school uh, for this. The foundation of, yeah. of many of these issues and concepts are laid down in primary school That's as well. Uh, although this data is collected at 15, it's far too late to be, think to be influencing career choices and subject options by that age. Let's lay these roots down in, in primary. Thank you. Um, and thank you again to all, all of our panel members for giving up their time to uh, come and share their expertise and views with us today. So if we can give them a round of applause. So that brings the global launch of 2015 PISA to a close. As I said, we've been delighted at the EPI to be able to host the OECD um, for the first global launch in the UK, no less. Um, in the EPI, we'll be continuing our programme of work on looking at international benchmarking and how we can use, them, uh, use those benchmarks and comparators in a UK and England context, um, but as well also always keeping in mind the context, um, the, uh, Amanda's uh, very valid point about correlation and causation. Um, so keep an eye out for our programme of work. Um, if you'd like to know more about EPI, grab one of our team members. We've got about five or six people here. Come and talk to me um, as you're leaving. But thank you again for coming and for staying to the end. Thank you.